invite you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Luke, the 15th chapter. Luke, the 15th chapter. I'm going to begin reading with verse number 11. What has been termed by many people to be the greatest of all of the short stories ever told any time, anywhere, by anyone. A story that rolled in the context of Jesus' conversation with regard to lostness and what it means to be lost and how important it is that that which is lost will be found so that it does not remain forever lost. We call it the story of the prodigal son. It is the story about G of Jesus telling us about God's longing and yearning and hoping and looking for the return of the sinner, for the coming back to the place where he ought to be of the wayward child, of the child that has gone astray. So read along with me as we begin with verse 11 in this 15th chapter of Luke's Gospel. I'm reading from the New International Translation now. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, sent off for a far or distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything... There was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need, so he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him and ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. And the story goes on to talk about how that the older son was moved with jealousy for that which the father did for the younger son. One of the things that I find all remarkable and yet at the same time awe-filling is the idea that somehow we think that we can understand God that we think that we with our finite mental capacities can place within our understanding God and who God is and what God is all about. We forget that He Himself has testified that His ways are higher than our ways and they are past our finding out and beyond our understanding. And because God's ways are higher than our ways, and because he is past finding out, and because of our infinite in capacity to not understand God, God has chosen that he will make himself understandable to us, that he will condescend, that he will reveal himself in a way that we can understand who God is, and we can understand something about who he is. And so it is that he revealed himself and has revealed himself and continues to reveal himself by accommodating himself to our limitations, to our inability to comprehend the infinite, 
to our inability to begin to understand what it means to contain all of the power and all of the glory and all of the honor and all of the majesty that the choir sang about wrapped up in a personality that will live and has lived without beginning and has no end, eternal. But one of the things that we need to confront is a very simple truth. People are known by what they do. And if we're going to understand God, we're going to have to understand what it is that God does in our world. When we introduce one another to our acquaintances, when we introduce one friend to another friend, we introduce them as such and such. He is a bricklayer or he is a... Uh, artist or he is an accountant or he is a lawyer or he is this or he is that. We identify people and we know people by what they do with their lives. Indeed, we classify people when we hear, oh, he's an attorney. We immediately begin to think he must be a crook. I don't know why. Or he's a used car salesman. That always gets our attention and we immediately pigeonhole that individual or he is a banker and immediately we have another image of what that individual is like when they are identified by what they do we immediately began to get a picture an image of a feeling uh, an idea a grasp for who they are rather than standing back and taking the full measure of the man and so it is that God has chosen to reveal himself by what he does one of the keys to understanding this book and having it come alive to you is understanding that in this book you have the record and the revelation of what God does among men, that He acts in our midst, that He becomes a vital link in the affairs of men. And so it is that He reveals Himself through what He does. That he has chosen to reveal what He does through his son and so Jesus becomes the image that we look at to understand God he becomes the visible of the invisible he becomes that which makes God known to us and so what we really have in this story that Jesus is telling in the 15th chapter of Luke's gospel is not simply a parable of a prodigal son who has wandered off and gone astray or one who has deliberately by choice chosen a way foreign to his father but what we really have in this picture in contrast to the lostness and inanimate nature of a lost coin is a loving father longing for a wayward child to come home. And the picture, while so often we focus upon the prodigal who has gone away and we talk about the depth of his degradation and the squandering of all of his good, the picture really focuses on the father who is loving this son in the midst of the calamity of his life and who's loving him enough to allow him to confront life on his own terms. We live in a world that is changing. My children adapt to change much more rapidly than I do. I adapt to change much more rapidly than my parents did, and they in turn more so than their parents. As our world becomes more fluctuating and changing rapidly, I read the other day that any man entering any career, regardless of what that career is, best prepare to change at least two times in his lifetime because what he's doing will cease to be a career in his lifetime at least two times. So he'll have three distinct and different careers. Flexibility is an important ingredient in life. The ability to make transition from one era to another, from one occupation to another, becomes vital to survival in this world. Ours is a changing world. And in that changing world, in this technological age in which we live, things rapidly deteriorate and they can be built overnight. We sometimes stand back in awe at what happens to our family as they become degenerating and disintegrating in our midst. And we wonder, how could it happen so quickly? It's easy. It's easy when a son can board a jet airliner and cross a land and be away from his parents and out of sight in a matter of hours in a whole new culture and environment. I remember visiting in a home of a fellow that I may have alluded to before in Boulder, Colorado, when we had gone there. 
how that this fellow, we got his name from Good Hello Baptist. You know, that's those Baptists that moved from Tennessee and Kentucky and Georgia and North and South Carolina and uh, Alabama and Mississippi, Louisiana and Texas, and they moved to Boulder, Colorado. And while they were in all those other places in the Bible Belt, wrapped up and circled around by all of their family and their friends who were church-centered, and suddenly they find themselves in a new culture where there's no one who cares what they do or how they do it or if they do it. And I visited in the home and knocked on the door of this fellow. I had his name from Hello Baptist right out of Nashville, Tennessee. Sunday school board sent it. Need to go see this fella. He's a Baptist from, and in his case, he was from Georgia, just out of Atlanta. And we went to see him, and we knocked on the door, and he wanted to know why Baptists were coming to see him, so I showed him the little card that said, Hello, Baptist. He said, I'm not interested. He said, when I got out here, I made up my mind I wasn't going to church anymore. I was tired of meeting the expectations of everybody else. And I knew if I was out here, it'd be easy for me to do what I wanted to do. We have technologically made it easier to shirk our responsibility, to throw aside the responsibility of sonship. And there is that great difference between night and day as we separate ourselves. But regardless of where we are, whether it's in Boulder, Colorado, whether it's in Atlanta, Georgia, whether it's in the Mekong Delta, whether or not it's in the European continent or in the Soviet Union or in South Africa or wherever it is, one thing has not changed. And it is this, God is still yearning and longing for the return of the sinner. Wherever he is, whatever color he is, whatever language he speaks, whatever culture he has, God still longs for his return. And this parable, this story that Jesus tells us in this chapter is the story of the faithfulness of the Father and his love. One of the things that I think demonstrates his love beyond any other measure, perhaps, is the fact that he let that son leave his house. He demonstrated his love for his son by allowing that son in his rebellion to walk out the door. In the story, as Jesus tells it, You'll not find anywhere where the father sat down with the son and he said, now look, son, what you're doing is a mistake. If you do this, you're going to pay a high price. Nowhere in the story do you find him trying to remind the son of his responsibilities to the father and to the family. I think there's some wisdom here. I think there's a lesson here for those of us who are earthly fathers and some of us should have learned it early and some of us ought to learn it now. He was no less hurt. The pain was no less deep for this father as he saw his son take his possessions and leave the house and head for a far country going to what the father knew was going to be a disaster. This father was wise, wise enough not to shut the door behind the son who was leaving, not to make it impossible for that son when sin had run its course not to be able to return. Oh, I'm sure he tried to reason with him. I'm sure he explained to him all of the things, but you ought to try explaining things sometimes. Sometimes fathers aren't the brightest people in the world. No one knows that more than fathers. But the the objections and the explanations cannot compete with a desire to be free and on one's own. So there was no sharp criticism and there was no uh, castigation and there was no degrading of the young man even though it was an embarrassment, and it is an embarrassment, 
when a father has to explain to the neighbors that the young son is gone, that he has come and demanded when he has to go and liquidate some of his estate in order to give the son his share of the inheritance and to explain why he's doing what he's doing. But you see, the father saw the importance of his son and his love for his son was greater than what the neighbors might think or what the financiers might think or what anyone might think. It was important to that father that that son understand that even though he did not agree, he still loved him. You see... This father thought more of his son than he did his wealth. Even though he had spent a lifetime accumulating it, his son was more important to him. You see, the laws of inheritance in that day allowed certain things to take place that we don't particularly do these days. Of course, IRS makes it a little easier because we give it away ahead of time. But in that day when a father died, a double portion went to his oldest son and a portion went to all of the other sons and the daughters didn't get much of anything. They had to depend on the sons, their brothers or husbands. But it was possible and it was often done that a son would come and he would say, Father, I want to be on my own. I want to strike out in my own direction. Give me that portion which falls to me. Now, when he did that, anything that was accumulated later on, he'd forfeited. He had no share in it, no legal claim to it, no right to it. Indeed, his elder brother would have had the claim to all that remained. But it was permissible. It was considered to be the height of insult to the father, but it was legal and it was permissible and it was done quite frequently. And so the son came to the father and he said, Father, give me whatever I'm going to get. Give it to me now. I've got plans. You know, the father didn't point out to the son, you know, this is a foolhardy thing you're doing. It's a certain lack of consideration, son. You know that, don't you? Son, here's what's going to happen if you do this and if we go ahead. Instead, he just gave him the money, let him go, gave him his blessings, said, I'm going to pray for you. God bless you. God prosper you. God use you as you go. You see, to do anything else, to do anything else would have communicated to that son, I've got a hidden agenda. I'm doing this with mixed motives. Perhaps just to keep it for myself. Perhaps to use it on your older brother. You remember in Numbers 13, 14, Israel came to the promised land and God said, enter in. And they sent in the spies and the spies came out, 10 of them there at Kadesh Barnea. And they were terrified and they said the land is flowing with milk and honey and all the things God said. But there are giants in that land and we are like grasshoppers among the giants. That they were fearful and they didn't enter in. God didn't get behind them and say, you're going in the promised land no matter what. You're going in. He didn't say that. He said, all right. If you choose not to go in, that's fine. But remember, you pay the consequences of the choice. And so they left and they returned to the wilderness and for 40 years they wandered in the wilderness. And when they came to the, guard, the border again and they stood at River Jordan at flood time, they crossed over into the promised land. They didn't need any encouragement. They didn't need anyone to push or prod them. They had learned the lesson of experience. Each one of us, like this prodigal son, has been born with certain attributes all of us given a certain amount of time which we will live, talents that we can exercise, physical and mental resources that have been given to us to be utilized in the living of life, and what we do with them is our choice. God said, I'm giving them to you. I'm entrusting them to you. Use them. Use them wisely. You see, God has the right to tell us what to do with our time. Because all the time we have, He has given us. God has the right to tell us what to do with our talents because what talent we have, He has given to us. He has the right to tell us what to do with our mental prowess and our physical prowess because without Him, we'd have none of it. 
He has the right. He has the authority. But he lets us choose how to use it. He allows us through rebellion to squander what he in love has given to us. Isn't that an amazing thing about God? He's given you life three score and ten years if God has been gracious to you. Anything more than that is a bonus on top. And he said you can spend it any way you want to. You can live it any way you choose. I'm trusting you with it. You see, God wants voluntary obedience and God wants love, not worship. So one of the things demonstrated in this passage of scripture that often we overlook is the fact that God loves us even in our rebellion. Even when we take what he's given us, even the talent and the time and the life that he's invested in us and we squander it, he still loves us. So that even if you have taken the all total of your life and you have invested it in riotous living in a far country and famine has stricken your land, God loves you still. He has not taken a pencil and marked through your name and said, because you've done thus and so, I'll have nothing to do with you. Instead, he stands and he waits and he longs for the return. That son in the story, Jesus takes great pains to talk about the depth to which that son sinks. He talks about him taking it and going to a far country and there in wild living. And wild living or riotous living means exactly what it means today going from party to party and from bar to bar and disco to disco in one place and another, he was hanging out with all his rowdy friends and they hadn't settled down. And his inheritance went like water in your hands. Like water in a sieve. It poured forth. And it was glorious. All of the people who were coming and going and all of the attention that he was getting and the wonderful time that he was having. And there's a number of lessons here about physical responsibility in this text. But by and by, the well ran dry. The inheritance was gone. He picked up the telephone and he called some of his friends and they wouldn't answer. All he got was an answering machine. If you'll leave your name and message, I'll return your call. But they never returned his call. He was broke, he was busted, and no one cared in the far country. And as life is wont to be done, as soon as he found himself financially distressed, Famine came to the land and it didn't matter if he had money or not. There was nothing for him to eat. But he did find a job. He found a job working for a pagan feeding pigs. The height of insult to a Jew. But what made it worse, he didn't make enough to buy anything to eat. And he wanted to eat the slop that the hogs ate. And the man who owned the hogs said, no, it's for the hogs, not you. Now how do you suppose the father felt when word got back to his house that his son who had taken his inheritance gone to a far country number one has been living in riotous living when that word came back what it did to his heart number two when he discovered that he was broke and had no financial resources what that did and then to discover that he's starving in a hog pen the 
You think the inconsiderate decimation of the father's goods hurt him. You can't imagine what happening to his son did to him. He wasted his wealth, he ruined his life, and he was in danger of losing his health, both morally, mentally, and physically. But the father loved him anyway. And he graphically pictures that in verse 20, the love that he has for that son. But it says that when the sun was still a long way off in the distance, the father saw him looking every day, as it were, on the veranda, leaning over, looking for that sun to come home, watching the horizon, looking for some dust on the road, straining his eyes to see him come. Something about hope there. You see, that boy's sin couldn't turn the love of that father into bitterness, nor did it cause him to forget that son. He kept a heart of forgiveness and a hope of anticipation that one day that son was going to come home. One day he was going to be able to forgive him. One day he's going to put his arms around him and embrace him. Not unlike Hosea and Gomer where Hosea's wife, Gomer, went out and left him, spent her life as a harlot, became worthless to anyone, became a slave on the auction block, no one to buy her but Hosea. He bought her when she was worthless, when she had spent all that she was, and he restored her as his wife and gave her his love. You see, we've wasted a great deal of what God has given us in those time and talents and influence that we have, not to mention the things, things that are reproaches unto God. But he loves us anyway. And he pays the purchase price for our sin that he might offer to us freely and without condition. His love. And so it is the son as he makes his way up the road. The father sees him and he runs out to meet him. He didn't humiliate the son. The son had, without question, humiliated the father. But when the son came to himself and came home, he didn't make him an object lesson for the other folks in the community, nor for the older brother. He did not extol himself. But instead, seeing him coming, he runs and falls on him. He kisses him, and he cries out to the servants, bring a robe, bring a ring, bring some shoes, cover him like he ought to be covered as a son, and let's have a feast and celebrate. I don't know what the son expected when he got home, but he expected to be put to work, working in the back 40 on the farm, doing some kind of hard manual labor just to get something to eat. He would have been satisfied to sleep in the father's barn with the farmers, the father's animals and not have anything in the household. But God is a loving father who will not have his children to live in the barn. He doesn't stop by just meeting his physical needs, but he restores him to sonship. He takes the son who had taken his inheritance, squandered it in riotous living, and he moves him back into the house, puts him back into the room that he had, gives him his former position in the family, and says, you are not to be a servant, but to be a son. Brethren, that's what God does when we come to Him in Christ Jesus. He moves us into the house. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for now we are the sons of God. You remember David and Absalom? Absalom, that son, not unlike this son in this story, 
who wanted to be king in his father's stead. And if his father had his way, Absalom would have been king. David loved Absalom with all of his heart. But Absalom raised an army and rebelled against his father, and he went to war against his father. And when he died in battle of rebellion, David cried and wept. When news came that the battle was won, he wasn't interested in if the battle is won. He wanted to know what happened to my son, Absalom. You see, God does not take delight in the death of the wicked, but he longs for their repentance. And so it was David cried out, Oh, Absalom, Absalom, my son, Absalom, how I would have died for you, Oh, Absalom, my son. See, David was ready to restore ready to forgive because he loved that rebellious son. You know, there's no indication anywhere in Scripture that God has ever, ever, ever refused anyone who comes to Him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. All day long I have stretched forth my hands to a wicked generation, offering life. You see, we may have completely wasted our lives. We may have completely wasted our resources in rebellion and wanton living, but God is ready and willing and able when we come to ourselves and come to him to receive us. So if you're here this morning and you're like that prodigal son, away from the father. Whether you're away from the father because of the attitudes that you harbor or the actions that you take or the words that you speak or the life that you live, he stands and he waits and he longs and he calls that you come home. He stands ready to receive you. To as many as receive him, to them gives he the power to become the sons of God. You're here this morning and the prodigal son is your biography. The loving father stands waiting to receive you. Heavenly Father, in the midst of our rebellion and our waywardness and our turning from Thee, we stand utterly amazed and astounded that You love us still. Having wasted our lives in riotous living, having dulled our influence through wrong attitudes and temperament, having wasted our resources in selfish pursuit, having neglected the talents that you've given us, but most of all, having gone from the house of our Father. You still love us. Father, we pray that as we leave this place this morning, those of us who are your children would do so acutely aware of the height and the depth and the length and the breadth of the love that you have for us that everlasting love expressed in Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray this morning for that individual who's here, who's never made Jesus Christ Lord of life. Help them, our Father, to see that the road to the Father's house is Jesus, who said, I am the way and the life and the truth that no one can come to you 
except by Jesus. And so, Father, this morning that those who do not know him as Lord, who have not claimed him as Lord of life, as Savior, that this morning during the invitation time, they give their hearts and lives to Jesus. Father, for those who have other decisions they need to make about uniting with this church, we pray thy will be done. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask the organist to play very quietly. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, the invitation to you is to come and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, to be saved. In a moment when we stand, we're going to ask you to make your way to one of the aisles and then to the front of the sanctuary. Come saying, I want to trust Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. I want to be saved today. I want to return to the Father's house. I've been wayward. I've been prodigal. But today I'm coming home. I'm coming home to the Father through Jesus the Son. You're here and you need to unite with this church on promise of the letter. You come on the very first verse of the invitation hymn. Step out into one of the aisles and make your way to the front. I'll meet you here as you come. As we stand together with heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around, the choir quietly singing the invitation hymn, you come, we'll meet you here in the front. <laughs> 